If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask that you turn to Second, I mean, yes, I'm sorry, Second Kings chapter 2. Second Kings chapter 2. And while you're turning there, uh, again, remember the meeting at Sunnyview Baptist Church this week, and there is a different preacher each night, and if you can uh, come, I know it would be a blessing to you. Second uh, Kings chapter 2, in the first verse, the Bible says, And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord had sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets were at Bethel, and the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And, uh, and he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee, here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went, and stood to view afar off, and the two stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle, and wrapped it together, and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that the two went over on dry ground. And it came to pass, when they were going over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, What shall I do for thee before I be taken from thee? And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy faith be upon me. Uh, excuse me, a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing, nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as this, they still went on, and talked that there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw and cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and smote the waters, and he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your sweet word. God, we pray that you would minister it to our hearts, to our minds, and to our lives today. God, make us understand you deeper than we've ever had before. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, some somewhat familiar verse, verses of Scripture, and I know it's a lengthy reading, because, but I feel like that we should get the full picture because what was accomplished here is somewhat missed if you don't get the full picture because what you'll end up doing is missing the story of Elisha's faithfulness. Now, we live in a day and age today where faithfulness is almost gone by God's men. And faithfulness is sticking with the stuff no matter how difficult it gets. 
No matter how difficult, no matter how long, no matter how rough, continuing to be with the Lord. And I believe today we've had so many people start and quit that that would be, uh, that we seem to think that that's all there is. I think about all the preacher brethren when I was a young preacher, and you know, most of them are no longer contending for the faith. They've either compromised and become something different than what the Lord would have us to be, or they just quit altogether. Uh, I've had one friend, really, in my whole ministry that I saw take it to the end, and that was Brother Gordon Downs. And, and you know, that's a sad state of affairs, but I think if we begin to watch men like Elijah and watch men like uh, Gordon Downs and see the people that, uh, that are faithful to the end and what's different about them, what causes them to stick with it. Now, first of all, you know Elijah and all that went through his life and all that had come down and really just a couple of chapters over is when Elijah got afraid of Jezebel and, and ran and tucked tails and went into the mountains. And by that we know for sure that he had to, at least for a short while, leave Elisha behind. Don't leave young men behind. Keep them in the faith. Keep them in the stuff. And, and so we see... Uh, that as well. Now go with me, if you will, uh, just to very quickly to 1 Kings uh, 19, verse 19. 1 Kings 19, verse 19. And we'll see the, the calling of Elisha. Uh, uh, 1 Kings 19, 19. The Bible says this, And so he, meaning Elijah, departed thence, and that was from that event, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Now, uh, I want you to see the significance here is wealth. Uh, most people didn't have one ox, much less 12 pair of oxen. That's 24 ox, uh, oxen to have, and this little boy was in a good uh, situation to inherit a lot of things and money. Give, giving up things for the ministry is old as the ministry itself. And we live in a day to day where men aren't willing to do that. They would rather have a career over successfully serving the Lord. And, and so we find that this man, Elisha, uh, what was called by Elijah, and he had to give some things up. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and, and he with the twelve, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Now this mantle, and as you can already see, it happens again and again, through the word of God, the mantle was kind of like an ephod that the priest wore in the center, and it was held on by a belt, and all of it together, the belt and the, the ephod together, was the mantle. It was for identification. It showed who God's man was. And so this wealthy young boy, it, uh, the, uh, Elijah's going by, and he cast that right before him and kept on walking. Now, I want you to see I'm not a free will Baptist by any stretch of the imagination, but I do know this. Those that are saved uh, can, serve, can serve him well or can serve him very poorly. And that part is a choice. That part is something up to uh, the, the servant of the Lord. So now we find Elisha in this moment of choice in his life What's he going to do? Verse 20, and he left the oxen. Now that's significant because uh, I, I'm not much of a, uh, I've not had a lot of horses and I don't know anything about oxen really, but I do know if any man, any, any beast you're leading, if you turn them loose, what is the natural response usually? They run. Right? So in that sense, Elisha took a great risk. He, he let the leash down and he ran after God's man. 
And, and you know, how, how closely do you run after the Lord God of the Bible? How, how, what do you lay aside each day where you might go to Him and be just a little closer? And, and so really, I, I, from what I'm reading here, uh, Elisha was re really in, in a situation that he was willing to leave it all. And Elisha passed by him, and, excuse me, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him, verse 20, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done unto thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of the oxen and slew them and boiled uh, their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, meaning the yoke, and gave unto the pe and gave them unto the people, and they did eat. And he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Now you get the full picture again. He was a, he was the one to be inherited, but he was not the owner of the oxen. And yet, by the the movement and the power of being close to God's man, he cut their throats. He built a fire uh, out of the yoke that they used to sit under, and. He cooked them up for everybody. Now, remember his desire was to go home and kiss mom and daddy one more time. Notice in your word, it's not there. I have to assume if it's not there, it didn't happen. Yeah. And uh, you know what it is? That, that is giving up your life for God's life. Your life for what God would have you to do. And all of you, except maybe the Andersons, and over the next few years you'll understand it, me and Mom were on the opposite poles of what we believe concerning what the Word of God teaches. And I spent that way uh, from the time I was 19 and got in a sound church to the day she died. It, it, it was just, we couldn't come to nothing. Sometimes you have to give up your parents, don't you? And I don't just mean consent them to death. You have to say, okay, if that's what you're going to do, but I'm going to follow the Lord. And that's exactly what we find that Elisha did. He laid it all aside, uh, <clears throat> his wealth, his family, and he went with God's man. So now, here we are, some suggest as many as uh, 10 years later, and I want you to see what his ministry was up to, up to this point, was to minister to Elijah. Now that sounds maybe flamboyant and, and maybe good, but what, is, what does a minister do? He cleans the house. He fixed the meals. He talked with him. If he needed something, he wanted somebody to run to the store, as we say in the modern day, he ran to the store for him. That was his ministry. He'd give up everything for something very routine. And, and sometimes it's hard for us to understand that, but when God's leading in it, that's certainly what we should do. So now with all that aside, here we are some five to ten years later, <clears throat> and we find them in a different place. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah unto heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now, and uh, if you will follow their their journey just before the just before this time, they were <clears throat> they were in a place called Ekron, and then now they're at Bethel. And after all these years, or not Bethel, uh, uh, they're at Gilgal, and all these years he had faithfully followed. Now, each of you think about, because you can only ask for yourself, what's the farthest you've ever walked? The farthest that you've ever traveled by foot. Now, my papa, my papa never could drive. He never did drive. And he would go to town every Saturday, and he'd start at Carlisle, and car start up this way to town, and 10-mile journey, and you know what? Most of the time he didn't drive. He didn't walk very much of it because somebody picked him up. He'd ride the running board or get up in the cab with him, whatever it was. And he, that's how he made it to town. Guess what was not around in their day? Nothing to ride. There were no people going to town in the same direction. So when it said you walked it, 
you walk it. The, the furthest I can ever remember walking at one time was when uh, Brother Ashley Hornsby got, got us all lost down there in the land that's owned by the uh, log company down here. And I walked and I walked and I walked. I've never been so glad to see Millie Lackey, anybody in all my life, is when they drove up in that truck. And uh, I, I would say we probably walked eight, nine miles anyway. And uh, that was a long, long walk, right? And you was ready to sit down for a bit. And so they're in this place now, and they've gone from Ekron to Gilgal. Now, get that, that is, they, they're fixing to start on this journey together, but we find them in Ekron at the end of, of chapter 1, and now they're at Gilgal. So somewhere in there they made that trip, and that's an 18-mile walk. That is like, if you want to compare it to what, I mean, I'm sorry, it's a 32-mile walk. It's like walking from this building to the first Walmart in Clarksville. Uh, that takes some stamina, right? That takes some commitment. And what is your commitment to the Lord? Are you willing to go that far? Are, we, are you willing to go to those expenses? Uh, the Lord has helped me uh, preach in a lot of different countries. You know how much, beside the assistance of the Lord's churches at time, you know who paid for those tickets? Me and my wife. Right? And, and I'm not bragging about that. I'm saying sometimes you make sacrifices. Sometimes you do what's necessary to get the gospel out. We'll find that Elisha, the younger man, was a very, very dedicated man unto the Lord, so the expense and the effort was no, was no price for him. What is the price of serving the Lord to you? And in addition to that, we, uh, I, I read commentaries on this, and, and it's suggested that uh, Elijah was as much as 80 to 85 year old, old, years old by this point. You know, when one time, and I, I could tell Mama was slipping up here a little bit before she died, but when I realized how bad her heart was, uh, she loved to go to Walmart. She'd go to Walmart and eat when she was hungry. And so I took her to Walmart. I'm like, Mom, you up to this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, uh, uh, so we got in that we I parked and I got as close as I could and but it was still a distance I'm like mom can you sure that you walk this far oh yeah, yeah, yeah so she got her little quad cane and here we go and she looked at me and she said Larry and she was just white and blue around her lips and so I called her and I said mom let's don't do this <laughs> and she wanted to go on and so we take about three steps, I would steady her, about the same thing, do it again, until we all we got all the way into Walmart. You know, Warren and Lutcher wasn't like that. He didn't know he didn't know that. You know, can you imagine have so much strength in the Lord after 40, 60 years of service? Still have the still have the ability to serve him that way. You don't you don't see the character of Elijah fading at all. He's still strong. Elisha's there with him. So he says, and Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. Now, after walking that far, I would want to take a break, right? After they had got from Ekron, they've got up now to Gilgal, and they're fixing to go to Bethel. Now we're up to a journey that's about 90 miles. That's about walking from here to Nashville, if you're going to South Nashville. Really, if you go to North Nashville, where most of us go, that's only about 70 miles. But if you go to South Nashville, where the fancy malls is and stuff out toward Franklin, that, that, that is, that, that's about 70 miles from here. And then you can see that they, and they, go, they go on again. And with every time he is invited, you stay here. The old man 
asked the young man, you want to stay here? Do you want to sit and rest? What is the natural affinity of the flesh? That is to stay still, to take some rest, to, uh, to uh, sit on your haunches for a while. But that wasn't, that wasn't the nature of Elisha. Where do you suppose he learned that from? Where, where do you suppose he, he learned that stick to it enough? He got it from Elijah. And they kept going. Now notice also, all along the way, he has priests, suppose priests, and, and all these spots saying, you know that, they're gonna, that God's going to take Elijah away today? Are you sure you want to see that? <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you actually want to see somebody uh, get up by whirlwind and taken back into heaven? Is that something you want to behold? I don't know. You remember uh, when the Lord was going to be transfigured and he took, he took Peter, James, and John with him? Do you want to see that? Now, in the flesh, we might say, oh, yeah, I wish I could have been there, right? But when it comes down to it, do you want to see somebody transform before you and become the very image of the Almighty God? I think in reality, if we get down to it, we would be fearful. Or I, I would. Uh, I, I have no business looking in, onto the person of the Lord God of heaven uh, because I'm so filthy, filthy and ungodly. And so... He was really dedicated to a thing all these other prophets wanted to avoid. You know, we live in a day and age today where serving the Lord with determination is there is almost no one who wants to do it. Hang on, I ain't gonna say the church, but uh, when Kenny was here, he went to a church over in Hopkinsville and I was like, brother, I, I don't think they're singing the same song we are. Huh. Uh, I, I said, oh, yeah, yeah, they're, they're right down the line. I said, no, brother, I've known that church for years. I said, they are not. They don't believe grace. Oh, yeah, yeah, brother. Oh, well, go, Kenny. And he didn't think he's going to get out of there alive. <laughs> uh, and all I could say is, I told you so. <laughs> right? And... Uh, we, we didn't get invited back, to say the least. But you see what I'm saying? It wasn't popular teaching. It, it, it wasn't, and that, that's what they lived in. And he, you know what? That church, if he had compromised and said, well, yeah, I do believe in the sinner's prayer. I, I do believe that, that, that man, it's in man's control. He would have gotten that church and he would have been set. I mean, they are a full-time pastor of church, and uh, that's, uh, that's how it would have been. And you know, that was the invitation of these men here. And you know he's going to be taken up today, right? You sure you want to see that? And he would say, yeah, I know it. Yeah, I know it. It's going to... It, uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with him. I, I, I'll see it to the end. And, and that's how we ought to be uh, with the Lord's service. Yes, I know it's going to be an end to it, but I will keep going until the end. Now drop down with me, if you would, uh, to verse 6. And Elijah said unto him, always along the way, that it was this... Uh, this request or this uh, offer by Elijah for Elisha to stay behind. Uh, which seems which seem kind of crazy to me that God's man was saying, Elisha, you can, uh, you can stay behind if you want to. But you know what? Elijah was right. You can stay behind, but you will not be blessed. You can put about half your effort in it, and it doesn't make you any more or less saved, but you get what you put in it. And all along the way, all along the uh, serving the Lord, people are going to 
to say, you can slow down. You can, you, you can chill out for a while. You can do some things for yourself. You can do some things for your family. And Elisha kept saying no. Well, why did Elijah, the very man of God, give him that offer? It was a test. It was a test. See what he would do. See, see if he's willing to stick to the stuff, even to the very end. And so he had this, he had this conversation with him. Verse 7, <coughs> And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and, and they too stood by Jordan. Now they're getting closer and closer to the catching away. And counting Elijah and Elisha and these priests, these prophets, there was 52. And they get to the river Jordan and 50 stay back. You know, that's not very good percentages. I don't know much about uh, percentages. Uh, I know a little bit. Uh, I was there when my grade school teacher taught about them. But if I remember my math correctly, 4 out of 52 is less than 4%. That meant business with God. Most people want to stay on the other side. Now, we have the river here that runs through town, and uh, I swam in the river years ago. I actually swam the whole river over at home at Cumberland City, but there's an island in the middle, and you get a little rest. That, that makes a big difference. Now, right here at Dover, guess what? Guess what we don't have in Dover? We don't have an island over here. It's all the way across. You want to jump off and swim the river? They pro and, and see, the thing about the Jordan, it's not like the Cumberland. The Cumberland only gets rough when it's had a lot of rain, right? And then it's not that rough because the Corps of Engineers pretty much controls it, or they think they can control it, right? Yeah. And, uh, but Jordan was in flood. Now, one thing to swim a river, another thing to try to do it when it's in blood, right? And uh, so they get to the edge, and here's where the big decision has to be made. Now we know God is going to make a way. You know what, what keeps me going is I know God's going to make a way. And Elijah knew it. Because he'd stood face to face with 400 prophets of Baal. I mean, this was and when they took the 12, uh, 12 barrels of water and, and placed it on the sacrifice. And he says, here is the God of Elijah. And boof, it was completely consumed. See, Elijah knew he'd seen some things. But that all happened before Elisha came over on the scene. You know, a, a lot of what I've heard about good meetings was 50, 60 years ago now. But I believe it, don't you? And I believe that I'll get to experience. So they're, they're, they're down right at the river's edge now. And they're looking across. 50 of them has done decided to stay back. And Elijah took his mantle. He wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that the two went over on dry ground. Now, if you follow close enough to the things of the Lord, you will find He will make a way. Was, was it anything miraculous about Elijah taking the mantle and slamming the water? No, the miraculous thing is that God divided hither and thither. That's what, that's what set it apart. That's what made the difference. And we can see things like that too. Now, a lot of times, because of sin and our reliance on self, we miss it. But God is still in the very same business of making a way out of nothing. 
He, he, is, he is able to do that. And so they walk over dry shod, just like the children of Israel did uh, when they crossed the Red Sea. And again, just like they did and went into the land of Canaan. And Jordan did the very same thing. And how many of you remember when they were crossing Jordan the first time, what they did? They took 12 stones, one each to represent a tribe of Israel, and they made a little stack and said, this will be a testimony. You ever wonder maybe it's split open if they got to see that little pile of rocks? Could be, you know what? And, and Elisha and Elijah may have said, you know what? I know why that's there. <laughs> See so that, that that that's the blessings you get when you put uh, when you put the Lord first and you trust what He has to say. And so we find that now they're on the distant side of the Jordan River. Verse nine. And it came to pass when they were going over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Now and only now, after those three invitations to stop. Ask what I shall do for thee before I, I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. He says, that was asked a hard thing. You know, uh, I, I really believe that the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is not preached enough in our Baptist churches today. But... It's, it's odd to me that he wanted a double portion, didn't he? You know why preaching is so dry today? It lacks, it lacks spirit. You know, when you go in and all it sounds is like a college text. I, I've been to college, believe it or not, and I, I've heard multiple, multiple college lectures, and that's about all we have today. Where is the God of Elijah? No. We don't need lectures. Now, do we need to get outside the Word of God? Certainly not. But I'd rather have five words spoken by the Holy Spirit than a lecture that lasts an hour and a half long. You see what I'm saying? If I want lectures, and that is a way to learn the Bible, you know what that's called? It's called a class. It's not called preaching. And, and, and so we see then that the God, He asked a very difficult thing but after 10 years of training, what did Elisha find? <laughs> that Elijah was reliant on the Spirit. That's what those years, those years had taught him, and he wanted the same thing. Verse 10, and, thou hast asked a, thou, and he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing, nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, <laughs> I love this, and it came to pass as they still went on. Now some suggest they walked as much as 170 miles this day. I don't see how they walked that fast, not for me to understand. Maybe the trip took more than one day. I don't know. But you know where that is now? Sarah Elizabeth, enjoy this. That's at the Georgia line from here south of Chattanooga. That's a long, long way. And if you've ever been over that, Lookout Mountain, go by Lookout Mountain as you're going toward the Georgia line. And that's just like this. And then it's so steep over there, they have places where the semi-trucks can run off the mountain into the side of the mountain to keep them from running over other stuff. That's, that's pretty scary to me. And so, you want to walk with me to Chattanooga this evening? I think that the emphasis of the text is this. It's going to cost you something. You are not going to have a free ride. You're, you, you know, uh, 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 I think it was Adam showed me uh, a, pit, uh, a video one time of this woman in Atlanta complaining about the bus system. And it's quite comical to watch. But she thought it was a free ride. No. Who's paying for the bus system in Atlanta, Georgia? The taxpayers. 
when you get the decal on your car, you're paying for the bus system. When you pay in your land taxes, you are paying for the bus system. You see what I'm saying? And, the, and we, as we serve the Lord, it's not a free ride. Listen, there's going to be hardships on the way. There's going to be difficulty on the way. And the closer we serve Him, the harder it is. Now, the question is this. Are you, are you willing to be one of those 50 on the other side of the river? Or do you want to be right beside the mighty God of heaven? That's the question you have to ask to yourself. And they're still walking. Still walking. Still walking. And you know what? I don't see anywhere where Elisha is grown. He's still walking. Still wanting to see what the end will be. As they still went on, and talked and, and talked. Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind into heaven. Now, I always, it irritates me when this is uh, misquoted that Elijah went up on a chariot of fire. He most certainly did not. He went up by a whirlwind, which was as it was promised to be, a tornado. We just saw the devastation of tornadoes in, in Mississippi this week. Do you want to go up by a whirlwind? You, you know what the natural thing of a, of a tornado is to be fearful of? And he said, I'm going to take you up by a whirlwind. I, you know, I want to go to the whirlwind. I, I, I just can't wait to be sucked up by a tornado. You know, that's a, that's a fearful thing, is it not? So this holy chariot split the living from the dead. That was the purpose of it. And as, as Elijah went on up, the mantle came down, he picked it up, and he took on and continued the ministry of Elijah. He walks out to the, back to the river, the 50 prophets are on the other side. Now, he knew the God of the Bible. But what did he say? Show me the God of Elijah. And he slammed the water. And it split open a second time. Why did he say that? He, he wanted to see God like Elijah saw him. That was what he was saying. I want to see the miracles. And you know what? He asked for that noble portion of faith. And he got it indeed. But he went, to the, he went to the end of one ministry to start his own. So what about you? What, what do you want from serving the Lord? Do you want to see miraculous things? Our God hasn't changed. He's still in the miracle business. He's still in the healing business. He's, he's still in the business of saving souls. Or how fully we would believe we'd be home to be with him. That's why I continue to preach the gospel. It's for people who are lost. And I point you to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. If I didn't believe that, I would quit where I'm at. But I believe that. So you that are redeemed, what do you want? Which side of the river do you want to be on? <clears throat> Next week, I'm going up to Michigan. It's a 12-hour trip one way. Why would I travel 12 hours, probably by myself, and it's always, every time I go up there for this meeting, it always snows, every time I go. So I'm probably going to see some snow. Why do I go? I don't want to miss nothing from the God of Elijah. That's why I go. And I'll keep going. Wherever they invite me, as long as I'm able and I've got enough money to do it, I'll go. Because just like Elisha, I don't want to miss I don't want to miss the ascension of Elijah. I don't want to miss one thing. So what's your desire? Some of you are young, some of you got a lot of miles on you, just like me. But whatever time that you have left, what is your desire? Are you satisfied of being on the wrong side of Jordan? I'm sick of it myself. I, I want to be on Elijah's side. I want to see the very best of the very best, unbelievable moves of God. Do you?